Hello and welcome to my workshop or studio. Don't get many visitors so thank you for coming. My name's Tracy Moore and I'm a silk painter and I'm Doncaster born and bred or Donny as those locals call it. First of all I'd like to thank Doncaster Council for sponsoring this project and also Chinway Russell for a tireless efforts to raise awareness of artists and art in Doncaster. This series of videos by Doncaster Artists is to explain a little bit about the different art styles, periods and movements in art history. It will give you a good introduction to the appreciation of art and also a first glimpse at some of the Doncaster Artists. You can come along to Doncaster Art Fair which is held three or four times a year in the historic market uh, square. It's a brilliant way to start an art collection because there's so much on offer and such a massive range, budget and choice. Um, so you're bound to leave with something. And you can chat to the artists, find out a little bit about their lives as well. They'll also point you in the direction of uh, other venues in Doncaster that celebrate the arts. Uh, and when I said point you in the direction, one of my favourites is The Point. Uh, where you can have a coffee and cake and admire all the lovely artworks that are down the walls throughout. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you a little introduction to the arts and crafts movement. This is a movement that changed the art world and that I relate to and also find reassurance in, especially as an unconventional and untrained artist. Painting and silk painting and especially but wearable art um, it's a little bit of a controversial art form. It's not always accepted in artistic circles. I'm happy to say that at the moment it very much is and I'm confident to call myself an artist. For the history buffs out there, the art and crafts movement started around about 1860 and it went right through to the 1920s. It's been revisited many times throughout history. The 1960s saw a big resurgence in quality made goods. Uh, and again, I think we're revisiting craftsmanship once again. I'm a William Morris fan. Um, and he, he's got a quote that actually I think sums up this movement. He says, if you want a golden rule that will fit everything, this is it. Have nothing in your house that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. By the way, that's not a good reason to uh, get rid of your dog or your teenage kids or your spouse, maybe, at this moment in time. But they really don't count. Just to put a face to the name, this is William Morris. I'm showing you these pictures in some of my books. I still like books and I love looking online for things um, but there's nothing beats a nice coffee table books and I've had this one since I was 17 um, and it, you just browse through them they're not to read from cover to cover they're just to look when you, you fancy them in it. As I said the arts and crafts movement initially started in Britain in London actually and the reason it lasted for so long was it practically covered the entire globe. Lots of countries got involved and could see the value of it. The founders were the first critics of the Industrial Revolution. They wanted to return to a simpler, more fulfilling way of life with less pollution, uh, more time spent on the quality of items and the quality of life. Much as many of us are feeling right now, actually. The whole ethos was that the creator, artist or craftsman put the heart and soul into every piece of art. The art and crafts movement touched everything in the home and it's believed to be the actual birth of interior design. The aim was to break down the traditional distinction between fine art and the applied arts. The Victorian Albert Museum say that it was a period to assert a new public relevance for the work of decorative artists who had historically been given far less exposure than the work of painters and sculptors. So it was a return to craftsmanship for furniture, ceramics, jewellery, stained glass, wallpaper, even carpets, the list is endless, look at anything in your house and it was to make that beautiful. 
It was about putting the soul back into make, making. Getting back to the designer and the creator being the same person. Taking time, love and care to produce a work of art. It comes as no surprise that the majority of the people involved in this uh, actual movement were trained as architects because if, if there's a, a vocation in life where you need a skill that's about precision and design, that's the one, isn't it? The moonlight encompasses many styles and it's heavily influenced by Gothic and medieval art, but a constant throughout is nature. Lots of artists say they're inspired by nature and I think sometimes people think it's a bit of an arty thing to say or a bit of a cliche, but it's true. Um, I think most of us are inspired by nature, aren't we? You go for a walk, see the flowers, leaves, trees, insects, birds. And you just can't believe that they just happen. They're just this beautiful world around us. William Morris, whose quote I used earlier, was a pioneer of the arts and crafts movement, but it didn't always feel that way. <clears throat> As a typical teenager, an apologist to any teenagers who were watching, um, no disrespect, but his whole family went to the Great Exhibition in 1851, which, by the way, was the very first art fair in the world. It was a celebration of art in all its forms. But Morris said it was all about wealth, the have and have nots, and as a budding socialist, he didn't want to be part of it. So he stood outside while his family went in. <coughs> Years later, I was reading some of John Ruskin's work. He was an art critic and very respected at the time. John Ruskin wanted to see a return to the working patterns of medieval Britain with guilds set up to monitor the work and the conditions that the workers were working in. Morris read one of his quotes which said, The difference between the spirit of touch of the man who is inventing and the man who is obeying directions is often all the difference between great and a common work of art. William Morris's frustrations with the world around him, the way that art was taught, design, mass production, had been summed up by another man. He promptly decided that he was going to change his life completely. He wasn't going to set up a monastic order and become a monk. He was going to train to be an architect like you do. And from that day on, design became his passion, until the day he died. One of the first things William Morris designed was wallpaper. And this is the very first one. Uh, it's called Trellis, and it's, that's exactly what it is. A simple dog rose and birds. He loved repetitious design. And wallpaper was a, a perfect outlet for that. As well as... Um, that design, one of his first three was this one, which is very, very famous work. Uh, we know it as pomegranate, but he actually called it fruit because, as you can see, there are lemons and peaches and oranges, and only actually two and a half pomegranates. So, why they changed it to that, we don't know. Morris was a man of many skills, and he wouldn't design anything that he couldn't build from scratch himself and to a standard of perfection. He wrote a world which allows the hand to rest the mind as well as the mind the hand. He wanted to see a return of the kind of work that the world has lost. Master's craftsmen still to this day look at pieces that he made and admire his skills. The Arts and Crafts Movement was really a coming together of lots of like-minded people, including the Exhibition Society, the Art Workers Guild, a large number of workshops and a lot of manufacturing companies because they'd realised quality was the way forward. <clears throat> Although the Great Exhibition in 1851 was the spark of the Arts and Crafts Movement, the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society had hit its first annual exhibition in 1888 and this marked the success of the movement. The Victorian Albert Museum said it raised the intellectual and social status of arts and crafts. The arts and crafts movement emerged from the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, 
there was basically seven people like-minded that got together poets painters art critics and they all believed that the teaching of art had become mechanistic and prescriptive and that the soul of the artist had been lost you can look up the seven pre raphaelite brotherhood but i'll start you off with john everett millay he painted the famous ophelia there's a picture of that there uh, at the time this was heavily criticized uh, one of the main things that was criticized about this piece was the fact that the flora and fauna that you see around Ophelia would never appear in, in one session. And that was because he returned to the site throughout the course of a year, painting the picture. And he believed if it was beautiful, he would include it. Uh, it didn't matter that it was spring or autumn or winter. Um, he wanted to include the beauty you could see around him, which again, really sums up the arts and crafts movement. So during the movement, William Morris also recruited Dante Gabriel Rossetti, again one of the seven and one of my favourites. He painted a very famous piece called Proserpine, uh, which is the Roman goddess term used to a Roman goddess of the underworld. We probably are more familiar with the Greek goddess name as of Persephone. Uh, so that's that one. You can see she's captive on the, in the underworld. It's very dark piece. And Rossetti in his own words wrote that she had eaten one of a grain of pomegranate and was enchained to a new empire and destiny. Um, the ivy in the background also depicts a binding uh, he talks about her being bound and actually the model was bound in what was said to be a loveless marriage and it was actually to William Morris because the model was Jane Morris his wife Rosetti was obsessed with her uh, throughout all his adult life he, he was obsessed with Jane Morris and that painting was painted at the height of his mental ill health and his obsession with Jane. He painted eight versions of the picture. That one that I've just shown you was the seventh, which is now hanging in the Tate Gallery in London. And if legend has it correct, all the other seven um, had disastrous accidents around them and were all destroyed. Another recruit of William Morris to the movement was Ford Maddox Brown. <clears throat> and his most famous piece is called The Work. And there's, it's not a very good copy that, but you can imagine it's a Victorian social system image. Masses of detail in there. And it actually took him 13 years to paint it, which is unbelievable. Another friend and collaborator to the Morris Empire was Edward Byrne Jones. <clears throat> And he's said to have been responsible for the rejuvenation of stained glass throughout Britain. He did paint and his original paintings very much followed the style of his friend Rossetti. And then he found his own sort of artistic voice. And his most loved paintings include a series um, that are in the Tate Gallery in London and they're absolutely enormous <laughs> pieces. Um, but they depict the fairy tale Sleeping Beauty, and this is one of them. It's called the Rose Bower. Um, so again, the detail, the the fabric, the, you you feel like you could reach out and touch every fold of it. It's amazing. One of my particular favourites of his is called the Beguiling of Merlin. And again, not a very good copy, but I love the, the colours in that and the mood. An amazing piece. So I've given you an insight into the arts and crafts movement. And another um, movement in art, period in art, was Art Nouveau. It started in London, in England, and it was called New Art. But the first reported 
piece about it in an artistic journal was actually in Paris and the translation was Art Nouveau, so that, that name stuck. One of my favourites is René Mackintosh, Charles René Mackintosh. Very simplistic designs um, and very much an inspiration for my work. I've got a piece behind me here, which um, is called Love Trees. I've done a whole series of these. And that's a little, little bit of inspiration from him and also Gustav Klimt because it's got a little bit of embellishment on it. So somebody else to, to look up when you're starting your journey on art, art history. So that's it really. Just come along to Doncaster Art Fair, meet the artists, take a little bit of their heart and soul home in a piece for your walls or in my case your neck or your head um i'll leave you with another quote from william morris which i think sums up the whole ethos of art i do not want art for the few any more than education for a few or freedom for a few thank you for listening and watching and i'm really looking forward to meeting you